is one of the biggest distributors that we work with is called Big Rock Tackle. Will is our factory rep from Big Rock Tackle. Also, they have Star Rod, Sea Striker, um, Florida, Calcutta, quite a few things. Will grew up in Navarre in Pensacola, grew up fishing on Navarre Pier, kind of like I did on Oak Lisa Pier, Navarre Pier. And so Will's been doing this his whole life, if you will. 30. 30. Well, I got you. I'm 55, so I got 25 more years of experience. Oh well. Well, Will's been doing this for a long time, been tournament fishing, and I'm going to go through tonight and ask Will a bunch of questions and see if he can answer them all, give y'all some really cool tips on how to catch cobras. We'll do our best. So, tell me, Will, you know, I drew a little picture up here, and you can use or not use my picture or whatever. When do the cobias come? When is cobia season? When do we catch them? How are they getting here? That kind of thing. Well, really, Tim, we're, we're just getting started. Any day now, we might hear about the first one being caught. Usually, we're looking for 62, 63 degree water temperature for the first fish to be caught. So, I'll report this morning that it's 62 and a half off of our beach. So. Really, any day now, we can see the first cobia get caught on our beach. Traditionally, around the 15th of March is when we'll see the first one. We've had an usually warm winter, so who knows how early we'll get here this year. So, you know, I think about migrators and residents, resident fish. You know, these early fish that we catch, are these migrators? Are they resident fish? Where are they coming from? What part of the beach? Do you think we should start looking in first? There's two different schools of thought. Some people think that every cobia we see comes from down south, comes all the way up around the Big Bend. I, for one, think that a lot of the early fish that we see are resident fish. A lot of these fish from last year have taken up residence on local wrecks just offshore, some of them in deep water. We've all caught a cobia on accident snapper fish, and it's a great problem to have. But a lot of those fish have taken up residence further offshore here, and they've got that instinctual need to feed when it gets to a certain water temperature. So some of these near shore wreck fish that have been there perhaps all winter, they'll hit the beach, and this beach water is what warms up the quickest. We get a lot of biomass, whether it's cigar minnows, squid, um, crabs, anything they'll eat. We'll learn as we talk about what cobia like to eat. They literally eat just about anything. So with all the influx of food for them on the beach. A lot of these resident fish are coming to the beach to feed and just instinctually they're going to go west because of what they've always done. So a lot of these fish I truly believe have been hanging around just off our shore and they get labeled as migrators but they've been here all along but they're the first ones that hit the beach any day now. I'm going to expand on that a little bit giving my theory. They're offshore of it, my picture here so everybody will know. This is Destin Pass, Okaloosa Pier, Navarre Pier, and Pensacola Pier. Because of the way that the canyon sits offshore and where the southwest edge are, the south edge, and Mingo Ridge over here, there's a tide line that forms up almost religiously every year. And that tide line comes off the edge of this canyon it runs all the way down here to the beach around what we call Opal Beach. That's about halfway between Navarre and Pensacola. The Fuller Pool, one of our local boats, they're very big on catching the first cobra. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but I'm going to say 17 of the last 25 years they've caught the first cobra. And in most cases, they've caught it right here, somewhere between Navarre Pier and Pensacola Pier. And if these fish were truly, the early fish were truly migrators, we should be catching them on the east side of the pass, not the west side. And it's funny, in most years, the bar pier will catch, or Pensacola pier, they'll catch the first cobra. And the bar pier will catch the second. And what's happened is, is these fish have moved down this tide line, hit this warmer water, and then turned to go down the beach looking for food. As the year gets later, this tide line moves from here and gets on the east side of Navarre Pier. So that's when the Navarre catches one. Pan Panama City Pier generally catches the third fish of the year. When Panama City Pier catches one, the migrators are coming. And my theory on that is 
the, you know, gazelles, uh, water buffalo, anything that migrates. They don't migrate on temperature, but it's just warm and dusty, so they're going to come early this year. Them fish that are in the Keys, they don't know if it's warm or cold up here. But they know when the moon's in the sky for X amount of minutes a night, we've got to swim to Louisiana to spawn. So the migrators, I don't think, my opinion is they're never getting here until the 17th, 20th of the month, somewhere around St. Patty's Day. But we'll catch cobias <coughs> well before then. But those are all fish that live here close by. Kind of agree, disagree? Absolutely. That's what I was saying about some of these early fish. A lot of people think that they're migrators. They're coming off these near shore wrecks that have probably been here perhaps most of their lives. They've been living on these offshore wrecks and they're coming up to the beach to eat. So, tell me, uh, you know, of course we can boat fish for them, pier fish for them. We're, we're going to talk about several different ways. Let's talk a little bit about tackle. I know we got a lot of different rigs rigged up here. What do we need rod and reel wise? What's kind of optimal? What do you like best? What do you don't like? Uh, there's plenty of discussion about whether braided line or monofilament is better. Cobia fishing is no different. Um, my personal opinion is on an artificial lure, like we've got over here, whether it's a traditional cobia jig, this has got braided line on it. Um, some of these other wax wing jigs from Shimano, the Savage Gear Eel. I like the braided line on artificial lures for zero stretch. I like to be able to set the hook immediately as soon as that fish eats. I don't want that big rubber band feel of monofilament. On the other side of that, I'm fishing a natural bait. Whether it's an eel, whether it's a live mullet or a pinfish, I like to have mono because you pull more hooks with, uh, with braided line. The monofilament does kind of act like a rubber band. It's a little bit of a shock absorber. I don't want it to stretch half the distance of what I got mine out, but I do want a little stretch so I'm not pulling the hook. So my rule of thumb, when I'm running the hook, I like to have all of my live and natural baits on monofilament. I like to have all my artificials on brake. That's line selection, monofilament. As light as 20 pound, I prefer 25 or 30 pound monofilament. Most guys traditionally use 30. You probably spool up more reels than most guys will ever look at when it comes to OB season. It's 30 pound mono. 30 on mono, probably 65 on break. Um, you know, so what about the size of the rod? Eight foot, nine foot? Tell me about the size of the rod and the size of the reel. How, how am I choosing a rod? Well, you mentioned two different things earlier. We can catch them from a pier, we can catch them from a boat. If you're on a pier, you're going to want a little bit longer rod. You want that distance. In case you're standing on the end of the pier and you see this fish swimming 75 yards out, you don't want your six and a half foot heavy action rod that you can't throw 40 yards. You want an eight or nine foot rod, graphite or fiberglass, or a blend. Either way it's going to work. But eight or nine foot with a soft enough tip that it can load up and throw your lure a long ways. Uh, now from a boat, it's a different story. A lot of that's going to be dictated by the height of your tower. Do you have a buggy top? I like a seven and a half to nine foot rod when I'm fishing from a boat. Nine foot because I'm so used to it. I grew up a pier rat and I've had nine foot rods since I was too small to hold a nine foot rod. But seven and a half is usually a minimum for me. The length of that rod is going to give you the ability to throw accurately and far enough to get to the fish that we've seen. So, get rid of this picture here. So, let's say that we're pure fishing, boat fishing, doesn't matter. But, we, we see our cobia. Y'all all know how great an artist I am. Yeah, it's a good fat cobia there. I haven't caught any in this proportion. <laughs> okay. So, and here's our boat with our tower. Cobia's got, where do we want to make a presentation to a cobia? It, you know, do I want to throw right out of him? Am I, am I 10 feet from him? How am I going to present whether it's lure, or natural bait, you know, do I need to just pull up to him and throw? Do I need to try to, what do I need to try to do? I absolutely can't stand throwing a fish that's coming straight at you. 
If I'm a little bit left, if I'm a little bit right, that fish may never see my lure. So if given the opportunity, I want to get the boat in position to where I'm not facing a fish that's swimming straight at me. I want to be inshore or offshore of him so I can throw beyond him and then pull it back in front of his face. I always want to make sure the cobia can find my lure, find my eel, find my fish, what, whatever bait I'm throwing, I want them to be able to see it. Very important, don't hit the fish in the eyes. Fish are just like any of you. If someone throws a four ounce chunk of lead and hits you square between the eyes, you're not going to eat anything. You're going to be pretty frustrated and swim dead. So don't hit a cobia in the head. They're very, traditionally they're pretty easy going. They don't swoop real easily. So take your time, make multiple shots without hitting them in the head. I would say it's more important to not hit them than get too close to them and put that jig on the top of their forehead to swoop. So, you know, and for me, one of the things that I think is real important is that if I'm going at the fish, you know, the fish are migrating from the east going to the west. So when we're going along and we're looking for these fish, when you're going from east to west, you need to be going fast enough to overtake the fish. Otherwise, you're looking at the same piece of water all the time. There might be a fish 200 yards in front of you, but if you're moving at the same speed he is, he's always going to be 200 yards in front of you. So you've got to go faster when you go to the west. When we turn around and come back, or back to the east, we can go much slower. You'll notice that the majority of the boats go out of the pass and go west in the morning. And they'll fish down. And my theory is I never drive by fish to catch fish. So I normally run past what, what Todd mentioned something earlier. And he said the dead zone. And what is the dead and why do we call it that? So let's put our pass back here in the beach. <coughs> and then we got Opelousa Pier. And we got the big Eiffel Tower down here and the big green tent. Well, normally, when I come out of the pass in the morning, if I'm running the boat, you get to see the sandbar twice. And a lot of people like to fish on the sandbar because the water's green, it's clear, it's easier to see the fish. It's easier to refine one once it goes down. But with me, you get to see the sandbar twice. We go out of the pass and we come in the pass. I don't like it up there on the shallow water. But I come out and we run all the way past the pier and about where the El Matador condominium is is where we start fishing. And the reason for that, when the tide pours out of this pass, it's, it's doing like this. And as the fish come down the east beach, they hit the pass and they get pushed offshore. It takes some time for them to get back down here to the distance that we want them at. Um, so this is the area that we typically consider the dead zone. It's also easier in the morning when we fish to the west. We have the sun at our back all the way in the morning. Sometimes we'll get to Navarre. Sometimes we get to the end of the houses in Navarre. Sometimes we get all the way to Pensacola before we turn around. If we start seeing a few fish, we don't go too far before we start working our way back. But I want to keep that sun angle behind my back. So, but right now, something we didn't cover is most of the time we are spot casting for these fish. So, tell us how we're going to, you know, we've got to see these fish before we're going to catch them in most cases. What do we need to do that? These are two of the most important tools you're going to have when you're catching COVID. We mentioned tackle, we mentioned the boat, we mentioned the pier. But most importantly, you've got to have a good pair of polarized sunglasses. Everyone in here probably knows the benefits of polarized glasses, seeing in the water, taking the glare off. You can't see the fish, it's unlikely you're going to catch it. A hat keeps the glare of the sun out from above, allows you to see in the water better. So we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, and we won't stay on it very long. But hat and glasses is probably the most crucial thing when it comes to cobia fishing. Because it's so much of a sight fishing game, you don't see them, you're not going to catch them. So, and see if, yours, if you think the way I do, tell me the difference of what type of lenses that I want to have. Because we've got two different types right here. Perfect. I'm glad you got a, a pair of blue lenses. Coast to Del Mar, probably the most popular polarized sunglasses in our region of the world. Rightfully so. They're a phenomenal pair of glasses. They make great lenses. Um, probably the two most popular, you sell them all day, every day. Would you say these are the two most common that you sell? Yes. These are green lens and blue lens. The green lens from Coast of Del Mar either has an amber or is it amber? Are all of them all. all amber as the base coat. 
and a green mirror finish. I prefer amber because it's fine in the middle of the day, but they also seem to brighten up the water a little bit in the early morning and the late afternoon. That's my preference. Um, the blue is traditionally something I saw, I've seen as an offshore type glass where they're going to cut the most glare, they're going to be the most protecting for my eyes. Both are going to do the same trick as far as taking the glare off the water, allowing you to see. And the base coat on the blue lens is gray. So you've got gray with the blue mirror, amber with the green mirror. And I, you know, I happen to wear the gray blue mirror when I'm driving around town, and that's what I was wearing when I came in today. But I would never go to a fish with these. They just don't let in enough light. You don't get the contrast you need to be able to see these guys. <clears throat> so we um, talked a little bit about the different types of, let's cover lures first. Okay. <clears throat> Tell me about lures. Um, most popular, least popular, why? We're going to start with my favorite way to catch a cobia, probably the most traditional way as far as migrating fish along this part of the coast. Uh, these are what we just call a cobia jig. It doesn't have too much of a fancy name. It's a jig for catching a cobia. Uh, when I was young, I heard it described as a chunk of lead with some chicken feathers, which is pretty cool to me. You take any number of different shaped heads, and they've got a collar on it, and then it's either deer hair, synthetic hair, chicken feather, dyed all different funky kind of colors. These are the most traditional way dating back decades and decades. These are the way that the cobia fishermen who paved the way for us, this is the way they caught fish. This particular jig here, I don't think anybody can do a cobia seminar and not talk about this jig. Um, unfortunately, he is not with us anymore, but Frank, there's a gentleman here on the coast, Frank Elton, he kind of pioneered cobia fishing around here. He was one of the originals. I wouldn't say he was the first, because I don't know that for sure, but he was definitely one of the ones that originally pioneered cobia fishing. And this particular head shape is called a dingling. There are several different head shapes on the market, but Frank was one of the first to ever do this, and I luckily still have a few of his original cobia jigs at my house. I meant to grab one before I came tonight, and I forgot. But his original jigs, if you remember the old lawn chairs that had webbing in them, he would take that webbing apart and strip it down into pieces. And that's what the tail of the original cobia jigs were. But if it wasn't for Frank Elton, we would not have the cobia fishery that we have today because he pioneered that. You know, the, uh, at Harvard Ox, the uh, Crowd Country Classic is named after Frank. And, uh, one of the guys that taught me a lot of things that I know about cobia fishing today. Can we pass these around later? That's a good look at them. Yep. These are a couple of the most popular heads. Just like Tim said, this was the original that Frank came up with decades ago. Everyone be careful with them. I'm not responsible if you stick one of these hooks in your hand. Tim will pull it out for you though. But be careful passing these around. These are just a couple different shaped heads for the traditional cobia. So we brought several hard lures, tell, tell, or just different lures in general. Tell me about those. Yeah. Cobia are wonderful creatures because they're fun to catch. You get to see them before you catch them. And a lot of times they'll eat just about anything you throw at them. When they're in a good mood and they're hungry, they're, they're not there just to look around because they're curious. They're there to eat, and they're, the migrators are on their way. A female is eating everything inside, packing on the calories so she can have healthy babies. So frequently they will eat a lot of things that you throw at them. One of my favorite ways to catch a cobia is on a topwater plug. This particular one from Shimano is just a great topwater popper. It floats, it stays on the surface as you jerk the rod tip. It splashes a little bit. It really can drive a cobia crazy. Maybe they're not quite interested at first or you're trying to get their attention. You throw this way out there in front of them, you pull it by them, it splashes and making a lot of noise. Great way to catch cobia. Top water, you get some really aggressive strikes with the top water, especially with a, uh, a cup face like this. If you go back and look at my Facebook page, it's probably 10 or 15 posts back, but there was a really cool video of a cobia eating a top water plug. This particular one by Shimano, they make several different ones. This is the Orca, and I don't remember what they're calling this new one here. It's got a jetted head in it that has a little funnel where the water comes out of the top of it. It makes a tremendous amount of racket in the water um, can really bring out some exciting bites. 
And after that, we've got a waxwing jig from Shimano. They came out with it a few years ago. I love this lure because it is so simple to use. You throw it out and you reel it back. The, the wings, if you will, on the top and bottom of this lure, you throw it out, you crank it, and it swims right through the water. You can put a jerking action in it to really make it erratic. But this is something that if you've got maybe not the most experienced angler on the boat, but they don't want to throw a natural day, they want to catch one on an artificial, this is a great lure to throw to a cubby because it's very simple. Throw it, crank the reel. Um, they come in all different shapes, colors, sizes, a faster sinking model. Um, this one we've got here is the 5.5 inch 2.1 ounce. That's going to be about the right size for throwing a cobia on the rods that we've already selected. So the waxwing jig from Shimano, foolproof, easy to use, throw it out, retrieve it, make a cobia seed. So I wanted to mention something about cobia jigs. I used to have a friend of mine who's become a really good cobia fisherman, but he had trouble catching the fish on a jig to start with. And one of the things, he'd done so many other things, whether it was bass fishing and Spanish mackerel, where you're moving the jig really fast. Well, I could never get my buddy to jig it slow enough. You know, when we talk about a jig, we're, t we're generally thinking, or at least a lot of times, something we're going to throw out there and do this number. That's not the way I work with code in jig. Code is right here. I want this in front of him for the maximum amount of time. So when I'm working a cobia jig, I'm actually taking the rod tip and I'm doing this. That jig's not moving up and down a great distance, but it has a lot of action to it. When a cobia is ready to eat, a lot of times when you see him swimming, him or her swimming down the beach, they're in cruise mode. Their fins are all tucked in and they're kind of muck, they're, they're on their way to migration. If you see one and their fin, his peck fins are already out and he's doing this number, and just gliding back and forth, you will catch that fish. That's a fish that's going to be really easy to catch. Because those peck fins are gliding, he's, ready, he's looking for food. The same thing when you throw a lure or you throw a bait and, and he's tucked all in, he's swimming along, and then all of a sudden he does this, work that jig about three or four times, and after about three or four times, just drop it. Just drop it about three feet. And you'll see, he'll be going along, and he'll just turn upside down. If you see the white part of his belly, it's time to set the hook. Because he just ate it. You may not feel it yet, but if you see him turn upside down, and you see the white of his belly, that jig or that lure or whatever it is, is real, real deep in his mouth. You can set the hook right then. You know, another great bait is the Berkeley Power Bait. This thing will catch Cobas, black fin tuna, tarpon. Um, it'll be a little, get off subject here a little bit. If somebody ever came in the store and told me that they caught three tarpon in a year off the pier, I'm telling them, I probably believe you. You told me you caught five, I'm going to start to call bullshit. If you tell me you caught 50, I think you've lost your mind. Jason Zabelski caught more than 50 tarpon this year that have photo documentation on this bait off the Oak Lusa Island here. It has changed tarpon fishing. It can do the same thing for you cobia fishing. It has so much action, we don't have to worry about how hard we jig it. You can almost throw this at the fish and just barely just kind of swim it along. This will get bites. Yeah, that power bait from Berkeley, Tim mentioned it. It kind of became a craze, what, two years ago, three years ago, with yep. the tarpon fish rate? You know, it's been long known that a swim bait like that in the bass market, big bass love to eat big swim baits. Great. Where does that fit into the saltwater world? Whoever had the first idea to throw in front of a tarpon and see how aggressive they eat those swim baits, um, I'm really glad they did. The cobia is no different. The beauty about that bait right there, it's a lot like the wax wing. You throw it out, you crank it, the soft portion of the tail allows it to wiggle, gives it a good action, and then just like the traditional cobia jig, if you stop reeling and let it drop, it's way within the front where it's going to dive down, very similar to either a wounded bait fish or just something trying to get the heck out of the way of a 60 pound cobia, swing it down like that, and that tail wiggles, that's when you see that white belly. So let's talk a little bit about live baits. And after the thing, I don't want to pass all these little rigs around, but everybody come up and look at them. We're going to have, you know, 
there's a multitude of live baits. We have three different ones rigged up. Tell me the dip, you know, we've got rigs that have straight hooks, circle hooks, and treble hooks. Why or why not? I'm a big fan of the circle hook. Like I mentioned earlier with some of the lures, if they're foolproof, I like them, especially when I'm running the boat. I don't know if I've got an experienced angler that's fished tournaments their whole life. I don't know if i got a guy who's never been outside the pass, like I was mentioned earlier. But a circle hook with a natural bait leaves it leaves less up to chance and less potential failure on the angler's part. A circle hook, by nature, will find its way into the corner of the fish's mouth because of the design of the hook. When the fish eats, it slides out of the bait, or sometimes the bait's still attached to it. As it comes out of the fish's mouth, that curved end point will turn it in such a way that it hooks the fish. So I don't have to tell a friend of mine or a friend of a friend who hopped on the boat with us, once you throw in front of the fish, make sure you got him about to eat. Then whenever he eats, make sure he's got it and set the hook. Make sure you set it hard enough. But don't set it too hard where you pull the hook out of his hand. Don't break the line. With a circle hook, once the fish eats, all I'm going to do is reel down until it gets tight and lift my rod and let him run against the drag. Circle hook, very easy to use, very effective. When they first became popular several years ago, I hated the things I thought. You know, I don't trust this thing. How am I going to set a hook in something when the points curve back towards the shank? The more I start using them, the more I have faith in them. They work so much of the time. Very easy to use. I am, I'm like Will. I'm a very big circle hook guy. I like it because a lot of times I'll have anglers that don't necessarily know what's going on. And I can have them just throw it at the, at the cobia. If he eats it, all I have them do is just flip the bale over. Don't do anything else. I'll worry about everything else. If the cobia eats it, I'll watch the cobia. I'd let them flip, close the bale. I just put the boat gear and drive off. You'll catch them almost every time. Yes, sir? Hook size. Hook size. Berries. So let's talk about hook size for a second. That's a very popular question in our store. What size do I need? It's about the size of this. You don't see the hooks go around? The ones that we've chosen tonight as an owner, Bluetooth Light 7 off. But don't get hung up on 7 off. Because I can get you an 8 off hook that's the size of a nickel. And I can get an 8 off hook that's 3 inches round. Every manufacturer, every model number is different. It depends on where they started and where they finished. And this particular hook. It is an owner moon two light seven off. There is a treble hook that we're passing around, and in the and you're going to notice that the treble hook has been modified. And I do like, like Will said, he likes. I love circle hooks, and I use them for almost everything except for fin baits. On fin baits, a lot of times I do like a treble hook. But a treble hook will, you will. Eventually, you will catch more fish on a treble hook, and you will lose more fish on a treble hook. A lot of times when you throw it and the fish eats it, the line will want to go behind the treble hook and get hooked into itself, and it will actually de-hook the fish. And the hook that we're passing around is a little, you can use five-minute epoxy. This is the epoxy putty stick. If you have a boat, you should have this on your boat anyway. This will save your, this will save your boat one day. This stuff, you, it comes in a little tube, you just break a piece off of it, wad it up, roll it with your hands, that will activate it. You can plug a hole in the boat, you can do a lot of different stuff, but this will save your life one day. But we use a little piece of that to put on the bottom of the treble hook that we're passing around. And that will ensure that the line never goes behind the treble hook. My buddies on the full pole taught me that trick many, many years ago. Um, Thanks for sharing that. I learned something there. I've been Kobe fish a long time and done a lot of it. I do not know to do that, but I will definitely take that back to Pensacola with me and employ that pack. I wouldn't tell too many people in Pensacola to get me in trouble. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about baits a little bit. The most, you know, there's, you know, there's all different kind of live baits for Kobe, but, you know, one of the most popular things to come anymore is the eel. If you're not prepared to deal with these guys, you will love them and you will hate them. But if you're not prepared, 
If you wait till you see a code here, and you get one out of the we actually forgot to bring a gift that tonight. Yeah. 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 You what? We should get a lot here. See if I put it back in the bucket. Hey, I will. All right. Just put it in the bucket for us, buddy. I have practice on this. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. I want you to take that one out of that bucket and put it in that bucket. Okay. Nice. Are these the main ones? Are you buying? Just, well, I, I mean, I'll bet anybody, they come in the store, you know, I'll give you five minutes and 20 bucks, and you can't do it. <laughs> You're not prepared to deal with these guys. There's just no way to get one. So if you will, you know, and everybody has their own theory. Most people put a small amount of water and about the same amount of ice in the bucket that they're gonna keep their live eel in. I don't like it up. I don't like that much ice. I like just a little tiny bit to keep the water cool. Good job, man. Dude.
and it will be so balled up, I you just cut it off and throw it away. Yeah, don't try to untangle it. If you have a needle on your line and you realize that he's tied a knot, your leader, and he's all tangled up in the line, don't spend 20, 20 30 minutes trying to undo it. Cut it off, throw it away, get something else. Um, one thing that we're going to oh, beat me to it. These little line holders right here, a lot of people down in South Florida will use them actually on their rods to hold the line so they can leave it in free school, which is a tiny bit of tension. Come up and look at these after the seminar. We like to mount them on the bucket. Once I get my eel in my bucket, I like to keep him to where he doesn't have a whole lot of slack line to do those weird figure eights and tie himself in a knot. I like to have just enough to where he's comfortable in the bucket, and I'll put my line right there between each of those gears, and this is actually adjustable. You can tighten it to where it takes quite a bit of tension to pop it out, you can loosen it up to where, you know, a big wave will knock it out. I like to have it to where it's not going to come loose, it just pinches on the line. I don't want it to come loose until I'm ready to throw a fish. All I do is just kind of pop it, snatch it a little bit, that releases the line, I'm ready to throw a fish. Very, very useful tool. One of the least expensive things you'll buy, one of the most important things you'll buy when you're eel fishing. Why don't you pass that yeah. and look at that. The little clip is a the little clip on the bucket. It will keep your eel if you're if there's two clip, your eels are like this off. If there's too much tension on the eel in the bucket, he will want to knot up. So when you're driving down the beach and the wind's blowing without the little clip, it's blowing pressure against the line. And that's going to make the eel want to knot up. And once he decides he's going to do that, sometimes there is no stopping him. I've had to take that eel off and throw it away. Um, as far as eels, eels are great because they're one of the easy baits to buy. You don't have to worry about catching eels. We sell them, they're expensive, they're $4 a piece, um, but they are very easy to keep alive. You know, like I say, I've had these in this bucket since 2 o'clock today, and they're, they're both fine. Except for the one that's in the knot. He's going to be he's dead here. To figure he's going to be dead here in a minute. Um, but that's just what they do. And I'm glad that we got one that's doing this. Hold him up. He's, oh, he's not that bad right now. But the leader is around his head. I can sit here and try and get this out. And this is fairly new. If you let it sit there and you're riding down the beach and not paying attention to it, and he's got several loops in it, it's easier to cut it off. Let's we'll see if another thing. But that's good that everybody can see what happens in your bucket there. Because you do need to be ready to go. So when we go, when I go go get fishing, if we're leaving the past, normally we get up in the morning, you know, start getting the boat ready, head to Harbor Walk, get some fuel. When we're pulling out of Harbor Walk, somebody's rigging up the rods. So we're gonna, like I say, I like to have two eel rods rigged up. I like to have two fin baits. So us what fin baits. What am I talking about when I say that? Fin baits, we're talking about fish baits. Yep. We're talking about live baits that have fins on them. Common baits for fin baits for cobia, a big pin fish, a pig fish if you can find it. I love a live mullet, um, ruby red lips, um, yeah. pretty much anything you're going to find in our area that's anywhere from 4 to 12 inches long that's going to stay alive pretty, easy, pretty well in your live well are effective baits for cobia. We discussed earlier how if you find a happy cobia that's ready to eat, they're going to eat just about any fish you put in front of them. I personally um, love them up. I mentioned that a second ago. Mullet just seem to stay on top pretty well, so I get to see them eat. Uh, something about Kobe doesn't like mullet, so they want to kill it, they eat it. Uh, really, truly, any live bait that you put in front of, any live fish can be effective. A lot of it's a matter of preference. If I had to pick my favorite fin bait, it's going to be a mullet. How about you, Tim? For me, it's definitely a mullet. You know, if, I, you know, if we're tournament fishing, and I see a, you know, if we see a 30-pound fish, we're going to throw a lure at it. We see a fish that's, I think, is close to 50, that can possibly go into that aggregate fish thing, or the most fish over 50. I think, I hear people all the time come to the store and go, well, you know, I've never lost a Kobe on a jig before. We never caught many Kobe's on a jig before, because I can guarantee you, I think I'm pretty damn good. And I think my catch ratio on the jig might be 70%. You know, might be as low as 60%. You get me to a live bait, and that percentage is way up there more like 90% that we're going to catch. So if I see a tournament fish, I'm going to probably throw a live bait of some sort at it. If it's a smaller tournament fish, I'm probably going to throw an eel. 
If it's a 100 pound cobia, I don't think there's anything better than a live mullet. Difficulty of mullet, you gotta go catch them. Nobody sells them. They don't live long enough in captivity. If you're gonna use a mullet, there's one thing that will drive a cobia absolutely insane. Doesn't matter which pet fin, but if you'll cut one pet fin off, doesn't matter which one. And half of the bottom of his tail. He can only do one thing. He can swim in a circle. Can't go down. Can't run away. So you throw him out there in front of the cobia, and he's going as hard as he can go. And the harder he tries, the faster he goes. He swims in a circle and it just drives him mad. They'll run up there and eat that thing most of the time. That's, that's one of my favorite pets. You know, my next favorite is probably a mingo snapper. I actually will mention another one. It's another very difficult bait to get. Probably above a mingo snapper to me would be a pigfish. But pigfish are very similar to pinfish. I think there's a picture of one in the little thing. Pigfish are excellent, excellent baits, but there is, there is some difficulty. You'll spend a lot, a lot of time catching pigfish. Um, whether you're trout fishing or cobia fishing or whatever, that's a great bait. There is an alternative to a live eel. Savage Gear makes these rubber eels. And there's another lure that's called a tube lure. It's the old-fashioned fake eel. Um, these do good as an alternate bait. I don't like to talk about these too much. We do sell, we sell a lot of them. I don't think I would go fishing and not have one in case I run out. Fish aren't, the fish don't want the traditional lures, they want an eel, maybe all of we've used our eels or whatever. Um, but the reason I don't like these as much is when you go to set the hook with those, they're so rubber bandy. You set the hook four or five times, the fish runs offline, and he runs out there, and all of a sudden he spits it out. Because you never really get a good hook set with those a lot of times. But it is a bait that you probably should have but it wouldn't be one of my top choices to throw. But there are times when it will work when nothing else will. Yeah, when it comes to artificial eels, Savage Gear has definitely hit the nail on the head. Very realistic, great action in the water. Only problem with them is, like Tim said, they've got such a long tail. A lot of times, Kobe will come up and lunch on the end of that. If you think you're setting the hook on a fish, he's just holding the tail. When he decides to let go, there's never been a hook in him. So I agree with you. But as artificial eels go, that's the one to have. What about using the live ones dead if they die on The question was using the live ones dead. I mean, absolutely you can. There's just times that you know, there, there, there are some cobias, like I said, there are some you're going to see, he's going to have his peck fins out, he's going down the beach, he's looking for lunch. That one's easy to catch. The ones that are difficult to catch, that's when you need a live bait. You know, you know so, um, but yeah, no, absolutely no problem to throw a dead. It's better, you know, sometimes the dead eel is going to be better than the loop. Um, um, one thing that we didn't touch on when we are talking about hooks and stuff are, is leader material. Yes. And I noticed that you rigged up a lot of stuff today. You didn't use hardly any swivels on anything. Tell me why that is. <coughs> yeah, we did that for a reason. We've got a few that are set up traditionally, mainline to a swivel, to your leader, to your lure, or the The swivel keeps the twist out of the line. Everyone knows, everyone who's been fishing pretty much knows what a swivel is. They kind of speak for themselves. One thing I've gone to doing in the past few years, when I'm fishing braid, because line twist is not as much of a problem, I'll splice the line again. Here we've got, Tim actually tied us when we got Bimini to a no-name. Yeah, I did that to a, a you I don't so, and I like this setup because there's less visibility for the cobia one. More importantly, this time of year when we're catching cobia, there's a lot of Spanish mackerel and a few king mackerel on the beach. The last thing I want is to hook a 70 pound cobia, fighting it out of the tower, get down to the cockpit, getting ready to gaff the fish, and out of nowhere comes a Spanish mackerel. And he sees that little black or silver swivel, and he comes up and eats it because he thinks it's something that looks like lunch. So I prefer to stay away from a swivel when I can. If I'm fishing monofilament, I'm going to have a swivel because that line will twist up and when the line twists, you're weakening it. Line management becomes a problem as far as throwing at fish. So monofilament, I'm going to have a swivel, but if I'm fishing braid, I'm going to splice line to line. 
for lack of visibility to the fish, um, as well as an accidental cutoff by another fish eating while we're fighting our original targeted species. Yes. What rate would the leader material 40, 50, 60? You named it 40, 50, 60. Some people go up to 80 and even 100. I prefer 50, is what I kind of go with. If 40 is what's on the boat, I'll fish with 40. If we got 60, I'll fish with 60. Um, anything above 60 to me gets a little bit too stiff, and I feel like sometimes, especially with live baits, allows them not to quite be as free swimming. Or, you know, we talked about mud. We want them to not free swim, but we want them to look natural. We don't want them to be. Do they get, I'm sorry, do they get leader shy, kind of like a snapper where you got to come down on them? They will. There are times. I always have a rod rigged up on the boat that has straight 30 pound mono to a hook. And there's just not, while well, we'd love to cut everything tonight, we just can't do everything. But there are times when I find that finicky fish and I'll have just a little circle hook, straight 30 pound mono, and a piece of squid. Throw that out there, and a lot, you know, one of the funniest fish that I ever saw, long before we ever had eels. Fishing with a buddy of mine, Jackie Miller, and his brother Mark and Jeff. And uh, we coded and fished together when we were kids back in the late 70s. And at that time, we didn't have eels, but we had octopus tentacles. We found this little 30 pound Kobe, and he's going along the beach. And we've thrown everything we have in the boat. He's not paid attention to nothing. Jack goes, well, I heard about this, this uh, octopus tentacle thing working. I'm going to go try that. So he runs down out of the tower. Hooks on an octopus tentacle, runs back up in the tower, throws it out in front of the little Kobe, and starts to swimming across the top of the water like it was like a dead eel that you ask about. But he's swimming it across the top of the water. This little 30 pound Kobe runs up to it, pops out his pet fins, spins around it about three times as fast as he can go, pukes all over the top of the water, and eats the octopus tentacle. You know, that was what he wanted. Um, so, but that, you know, sometimes you do have to drop down and leave the material. Um, how many people, are, are most people boat fishermen or anybody pier fishing here? Boat fishermen? Kayak fishing. Okay. Kayak, you yeah. say kayak. How many pier fishermen? None. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll spend most of our time on boat stuff. Then if, if any of the pier guys have a specific question and want to come up and ask afterwards, we'd be glad to cover that. Um, tournament fishing, you know, we are talking about, you know, Harbor Walk tournaments coming up, the Royal Rumble, those kind of things. You know, you go to all this trouble to make sure we have the right boat, the right rods and reels, the right gear, tackle, lure, bait, and everything. You know, we go and catch Kobe and bring it in and we lose first place by a half a pound. I'll give you a good example. About five or ten years ago, I can't remember, it's in the Hogs Breath Kobe tournament. And, you know, there's the option to gaff a fish or to net a fish. There's pros and cons to both. I mean, I've known people who, I've personally beat one off with a gaff before, not gaffing it properly. I've also lost one with a net because the net is more, it takes more time, you've got to be, do everything right. But at this particular tournament, I was doing the Waymaster job, and there was a boat from, um, the that man's out of Pensacola or Orange Beach? That man's called Pensacola. Okay, Pensacola. Well, Miles is running the dive man. But he shows up to the way station, and when he gets there, they've caught this Kobe. And it's about like a day big or so. It's just right out of 100 pounds. But when they brought the fish in, they had netted their fish. It was in an SSI cooler at the time. It was long before Yetis. Full of a slush brine. What I mean by slush brine, a mixture of ice and salt water and baking soda. So it hadn't been gaffed. And typically speaking, the rule of thumb is that if a fish that you gaff, or a fish that's dead, loses 10% of its body weight in the first hour. Well, I throw the miles of this fish up there and weigh it. There we go, first place. This fish is going to be worth about $100,000. Well, some buddies of mine, Enterprise, Kirk Reynolds, they're about two or three people behind him in line. Kirk's fish was a solid eight or nine inches longer and bigger in girth. Well, Miles' fish outweighed it by 11 pounds. 
Well, Kurt and them, they had gaffed it three times, brought it in, it wasn't in the cooler, it was laid in the bed of the truck, and it was wrapped in three beach towels. The difference between first and second place in that particular tournament was about forty or fifty thousand dollars. It's because they didn't take care of that fish. So what I like to do, if if you are going to gaff a fish, and I'm gonna let Will tell you about how to gaff a fish here in a second, but if you're gonna gaff a fish, we need to be prepared. And ladies, y'all get mad at me. But if you're going to cover your fish, any fish that you're gonna gaff, you need to be ready. When you gaff that fish, when you're bringing him into the boat, and it, you've got to be really, really careful, because cobias can be very dangerous. One of the girls that works at my store, Jessie, her dad has these three lines that go all the way down his leg. The tines on a cobia's back, they have these little tines. And then things are like razors. Well, Phil had one flip off the gaff and catch him about right here and cut him all the way to his ankle. And that's been five or ten years ago. He still has all those scars. So you do need to be careful. And normally I would tell you to gaff a fish and go straight to the fish box. But if we're tournament fishing, we're going to get we're going to gaff that fish. We're going to go to the fish box and instead of just closing the lid and being done with it. As soon as I get the gaff out, I want somebody wait for the feminine product. We're going to stuff that in the hole that you made the gaff hole. Because we want to preserve as much weight as we can. It would be the difference between you winning and losing a tournament um, if you have those products on board your boat. Um, but as soon as the gaff comes out, that goes in the hole, shut the lid, be done. Never try to get a hook out, never try to get a lure out. Gaff the fish, plug him, cut the line, shut the lid. Talking about gaffing the fish, you know, I know Kobe is, um, we both have a really good friend. You know, there's pros and cons in that. Well, not Miles' fish. He won a tournament because he netted it. One of our other good buddies is going to do the King Michael seminar with me, Bob Sharp. Bob lost one over 100 pounds that they netted, got it in the boat, and still lost it. It went, it came in the boat. They messed up with the net, dumped it into the boat, didn't have the tuna door locked, it went out the tuna door. <laughs> and it was over 100 pounds. <coughs> um, so what's the proper way to gaff them? I know there are, there's rights and wrongs to gaff them. One thing you never want to do, never gaff a Kobe. If you were to take this fish, draw a line down the middle, draw a line right down through the middle, right there. Never gaff a fish behind it. You always want to gaff a fish in the front. When you gaff him in the tail, you're going to probably lose him because so much of his weight and his force is on his head, he's going to get off, he's going to beat the crap out of you when you're trying to get him in the boat. So you always want to be in front of that halfway point. My preference is, let's, let's use this as a picture to kind of show where we want to go to. If his gills right here, you want to get somewhere in this spot right there. That's where some soft meat is. That's where you can control the fish and get it right into your fish box as quick as possible. One of the most important things when gaffing a cobia, don't hesitate. Be confident in what you're doing. If you try and hit the fish and then sit there and think about where am I going with it, a fish may flop off. That fish may torque the gaff out of your hands and you just lost your gaff and the fish. It's pretty frustrating. Um, you know, if we're going to gaff the fish right here, you know, it is important that this gaff hook goes, and this is the handle of the gaff. It has to go all the way through Harvey. You can't just have it in this belly down. It's That's got, absolutely it's got to go in the, it, while you want to get a soft spot to get in, we got to bury the gaff into something that has enough meat that we're going to pull a 100 pound fish into the boat. And that's where you, we should have brought some gaffs to, to yep. show. We, we failed you on that. We can describe them though. Um, the gaff that you've got, don't use one of those weeny little skinny gaffs that you're going to snap uh, gaff a red snapper with in the lid or something like that. Make sure you've got a good gaff that you would stick a wahoo or a larger fish with, a good heavy duty gauge hook on it, and make sure the time is long enough that if you do hit them in that soft spot, you get up into where you can control the fish it's not going to rip out of that soft spot. If you do happen to find yourself on a boat with just a little two or three inch hook, make sure you hit them in the back where it is 
nice and firm meat. My preference is to get the fish near the boat. Um, see if we can, eh, I don't want to hop up there and dirty it up. But you want to get the fish near the boat, have the fish the direction you want it. Don't ever go across the line. As you come up with the gaff, if you hit that line, you can break off. Yeah, you're yeah, the man. We're going to get a gaff over here. And so what Will was talking about a second ago, if I'm the angler, and I have the cobia right here, I do not need to be back here. Will has the gap. He needs to be back there. I need to be up here bringing that fish up alongside the boat. Yeah, we're going to, we'll just kind of, let's go back to the eel right here. This is what eel will do when he gets mad at you and says, I don't like that tension. You are not going to get that knot out, especially not trying to throw it at a fish. Cut it off. <laughs> Put it back in some water if you want. Maybe he'll unravel himself once there's no tension, but don't try and fish it like that. You will not catch cobia. Uh, as Tim was saying, you don't want your angler in his back corner here, pointing the rod this way. Imagine Tim and I are in the boat. Tim's got a fish on. I want Tim about where this rod holder is in front of me. I'm going to be in this back corner, and we're hopefully going to have the boat in gear so the fish is pointed the right direction. And I'm going to come with Tim's line coming on my left side, so I'm not across the line. And then I'm going to get back in this corner, and I'm going to go across the fish's back. Where I like to kind of position my gaff is put the shaft of the gaff right on his peck fin, which is probably going to be out at this point. He's trying to get away. Put it right across his peck fin. And when I come up with it, I don't hit him and stop and wait a minute before I pull him in the boat. I want to hit him in one continuous motion, know where I'm going with it, whether we've got an ice box under the helm, whether we, we're just going to get him in the boat, beat him, whatever we're going to do, we want to hit him with one continuous motion. Hit that fish, come into the boat with it, and make sure you don't hit your buddy with it. Kobe have really hard heads. One thing Tim mentioned, they do have those spines across their back. They will cut you real deep, um, so be real careful with them. Respect them. And I always forget a few things and have to backtrack a little bit. On your boat, let's say we're fishing on one of the little airplanes here, and we have our, your know, Todd was talking about has an upper steering station controls and everything. So if you can think about a boat, you know, like this, and here's our center console, and our steering wheel's right here. I like to go Cobia fishing with no left. I like, really like three guys. So I'm driving, I'm here, and I got an angler here and an angler here, and I have my two rods here that have eels. I have a fin bait, a fin bait, and then in the rocket launcher here, my lure rods. It's very, very important that the driver always drives. We can take turns throughout the day. I'll drive for an hour, and Will's going to drive for an hour, and Tom's going to drive for an hour. But when you see a fish, the worst thing is when everybody panics and everybody wants to throw. It's real important that the driver throws. So, as the driver, my responsibility of area to look is here. This angler's, he's looking here, and this angler got this one, and I'm looking here. So we all have our dedicated area to look. And if I'm driving, and Will's on this side, and he's supposed to be looking over there, and everybody wants to talk and do stuff, but Will's looking at me talking, he can't see his area. I can talk and look, because I'm looking straight ahead. But then the anglers on the outside need to be covering their territory, or he'll drive right by fish. Forgot about that earlier when we were talking about how we set up the boat and everything. Yeah, that was, I'm glad you brought that up, Tim. You mentioned having a minimum of three guys. That is ideal. My preference is to have at least three anglers on board, whether it's a driver and two anglers, however you want to designate them, what you want to call them. Having those three, and it's important that you keep an eye on your session. Like you said, Tim, a lot of times it's towards the end of the day. If you haven't seen a fish in an hour or two, you might want to get bored and just talk with each other. If you're on the right side of the boat, look at them the right side of the water. You never know when that fish, you know, might pop up right beside the boat. These fish do go up and down quite a bit. Sometimes 
you'll just be standing looking where you've been looking all day and then all of a sudden here comes a 50 pounder that you're going to catch. So always keep your eyes on the water. That goes back to the most important two tools we have, which is things to help you see the fish. Hey Tim, when you're driving, you're going into the fish, mm -hmm. when you see a fish as a driver, what do you, what sort of the, the two or three things you do once you spot a fish? Do you okay. point the boat, turn it, idle, what do you, how do you? The question was, if you're driving along, if you're driving, if you see a fish coming at you, what do you do? Pip, the question, my answer is it depends. Depends on how close the fish is. Because when you're driving out, it's going to happen much faster than when you're catching up to them. So if, if I'm going at the fish, if we see him where that blue boat is, right there, somebody's going to have to throw. Whether, we, whether we're going to bow stem him or not, somebody's going to have to throw. Because he's going to be right here in just a second. If we see that fish from here to that wall over there, I'm going to get the boat out of gear and I'm getting offshore of the fish. I want the fish between me and the beach. And the reason for that is, is that the fish goes down. If we spook him and the fish goes down, I have a much better chance to find him if he's pinned between me and the beach than if he's offshore. Much easier to refine that fish. And sometimes I don't have that option. It just depends on how far we see him away. Um, if I'm going with the fish, if, if, um, if we're going this direction and I see the fish up there, we are getting, I mean, we have plenty of time to do stuff now. We're going offshore of the fish. We're going to get up in front of the fish and slide back in on the same line that that fish is on. And I'm going to let this fish swim right to the back of the boat where I can just pitch stuff at him. And that way, I've got him right behind me. The worst thing you can ever do is put the boat in reverse. If you hit reverse, you can pretty much go look for another fish. You change that sound. When, when you're driving along, they hear the motors blah, 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 blah. Everything's kind of cool because it's been happening for a long time. But when you put it in reverse, something changes. The pitch changes. And also, now he's on, that fish is on alert now. So never, never, never hit reverse. You never leave the beach, though? I've never been here, so. You never leave the beach? Like, Half mile out, or you never. And we, we probably missed one of the most important things. If you remember Tim's original drawing, here's the beach right here. Here are the piers. We're staying right up against the beach, maximum 60, 70 feet of water. Usually it's going to be 40 foot or less. We're going up and down the beach. You know, it, it's almost kind of funny and ironic that we've got these big giant boats with huge towers capable of running way to the southwest and catching tuna and running all over the world. And instead of running way offshore, all we want to do is get out the pass and turn right and stay on the beach. But that's where these fish are migrating. Um, we talked earlier about migrators and resident fish, but where these fish, we're going to find them is on the beach. It might not necessarily be in two feet of water where kids are swimming. Yeah, but you're saying all the fish are on the beach. Do you remember these fish just were half mile offshore? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, a half, a half to maybe, what would you say, two miles offshore is about as far as you want to be. Yeah, I did, we definitely would fish two miles offshore. Oh, okay. But generally speaking, it's you got the sandbar, which is the water on the sandbar is that bright green color. And then it has a drop off there, and the water kind of blends from green to, to that bluish color. And that's that blended color. I like to fish on the outside of that blended color. I fish much deeper than most people do. Everybody thinks, well, you can't see the fish out there. I can't see the fish just as good out there in the deep water as I can in shallow water. Um, so I, fish, I do fish deeper. And I, you know, it's not beyond me, especially on the west side of the pass, you have to fish further out. On the east side, they will get real, real tight to the beach. I've seen them in two feet of water, literally right on the beach. Now, is there like a wave action? Does wave matter? Well, they, you won't even be able to see them when they're three, four foot or something. Question is, wave, does wave action matter? Wave action, size of boat definitely matter. On a, I, my ideal day is a south to southeast wind with a west current and somewhere about two to six foot sea. That's my optimal day. 
Yeah, you asked about can you see fish when it's choppy like that? Certainly, it's tougher to see down deeper, but a lot of times these fish, as they're migrating, as they're trying to go east to west, that surface current is the fastest moving to the west, so they'll get right up in the top of the water, especially on southeast wind, where southeast is going to be blowing this way according to the beach. These fish are going to get right up top, and a lot of times we'll spot fish literally in a wave. You'll be riding along in the tower and you look at a wave that might be actually about to break or just a big swell in the water. And if it's moving the right direction, those fish will get right up top and you can see those fish sometimes even better in rough seas. Yep. You're not going to see them as deep, but they get themselves way up high. I love fishing three, four foot seas as long as you've got the boat to handle it. Um, a lot of guys are fishing smaller boats, bay boats with towers. It's fine, make sure you're safe. But if you're in a boat that can handle four footers on a southeast swell, Go fishing. I, you know, you know, in the size of boat, I would much, in most cases, I prefer a smaller vessel, something in this 21 to 30 foot range, because the boat is so much more maneuverable. We have more, we can get around the fish better. When you start looking at a boat like the Mod, the Mod is for 65 GNS. They start when they take it out of gear, they're not stopping until they get the blue much more difficult to operate. So, but on a, on a day when it's two or three foot, I would much rather be in a small one. On a day that it's plus six foot, boy, having that 65 GNS underneath is pretty damn nice. And they also have the big boats have a tremendous advantage on the day when it's slip glass calm. Because when it's real slick, the glare is tremendously bad. The wave action actually reduces glare because there's so much turbulence that it's not reflecting off the water. When it's slick calm, it's reflecting off the water. So in a small boat, it's much harder to see on a slick calm day than it is on a big boat. Because a big boat, you're much higher up, you get a much better angle, you can cut the glare much better. So size of the boat and conditions both, both will Maybe do something different. Yes, sir. I just moved from Mississippi uh -huh. and I've been fishing lemon fish there for 30 years. And no one trolls there. Everybody anchors and chumps. Yeah. Or may run shallow spots and chump. We have bars there that will run north south. So the fish will come up over the bar. So you'll anchor one side or the other. <coughs> Does anybody, and is there any logic? in shallow spots or off the front beach to anchor and chum. You, the question was, is chumming, basically, the basic question was, was chumming work here? Chumming works to some degree, um, but we have such better water clarity. If you're set up a chum slick and all of a sudden you've got a chum line that your chum slick's really working, it's probably four or five hundred yards from your boat. Well, the guys in the tower, they're going to drive down your chum slick and they're going to pick your cobies off before they ever get to you. Um, so, does it work? Yes. Is it very effective? Trolling? Yes. We catch one. You know, you catch it as bycatch. It's not a. It's not effective. This is a true sight cast fishery. Um, there is. We're in room trail officers. We got tonight. Good. So there is another way that's called fads, which will work for your chum. Fads are fish attracting devices. Technically, they are illegal. Um, you can, it's not illegal to put it out. It's illegal to leave it overnight. Um, all the tournaments, because they want to preserve how cobia fishing was historically done by driving and spot casting. As far as I know, all the tournaments on the coast this year have uh, put rules in place that you cannot fad fish. If you, you can't build a fad, you can't fish a fad, and if you have to get lucky and find a fish that's on somebody else's fad, that fish will not count. And they will polygraph the winners. And if people see you fishing a fad, they'll turn you in. Um, so, the bad fishery is changing, you know, so I don't know if that's going to be a viable thing for this year or not, because all the tournaments have banned it. Um, so, 
and I applaud them for trying something. What they're trying to do is have more free swimming fish on the beach, and they think that the fads have created the fish not being on the beach, and I disagree with that. I think they're not there because of the whole ecosystem. When I was a kid in the 70s, Kobe fishing was awesome. And in the 70s and in the 80s, it was off the chart bad. And in the 90s, it was as good as we have any records of. Because until about mid, probably like 82, 83, we got the first documented that I know of. And, you know, some of the people who've been around a little bit longer than me, Dr. Aim or something, may know something different. But as far as I know, the first 100 pounder was caught there kind of early mid 80s. But there's only been a few 100 pounders in the 80s. And then all of a sudden in the 90s, Harbor Rocks had a post the other day for their tournament, just to kind of prelude into it. Well, they had. 25 different 100 pounders that had been weighed in in several years. It was one year we caught a 106 pounder. If I, anytime I catch a 100 pounder, I think I got the tournament one. I mean, I don't have to fish anymore. The day we caught our 106, we were fifth in the day. <laughs> no, we did not win. We didn't go in first, second, or third. We didn't even win a day. Um, and Harold Waffler, who just passed away uh, about a year ago, he ran a boat called the Unreal. Harold has, as far as I know, the most 100 pounders ever caught. Harold's caught over, over 100. Um, he caught four in one year. I think he's caught more than four. I think he's caught at least five. They caught four in one year, 400 pounders. I want to go back to what he asked about chumming, yeah. like they do over in Mississippi, since it's, it's something I really enjoy. It's not traditional sight fishing for Cobia. The ideal conditions to do it, as we know, the fish are migrating from east to west. If you've got a current that runs west to east, that's a good time, especially if the water's real dirty, but you just, you got a day that you can fish. If you got a west current, uh, or west to east current, set up right here in Chum, because this current is gonna send your Chum slick back this way, the fish are swimming into it, it's, it's a natural occurrence that they're gonna swim towards your boat. So it is a viable option. It's not the traditional way to do it, certainly not my preferred method, but if it's real muddy water, and I've only got a certain day, and I know I'm going to be working however many days on the road for the next 12 days. I'm going to get out there and fish in one way or another. So it is a good way that you can do it. The way you guys did it in Mississippi, it is certainly possible to be done there. We got another question. Yeah, dude. If you take, you never can tell what you're going to see or catch, but if you take 10 trips in, in average, how many fish are you going to see? That is a tough question to answer. If somebody told me I could, somebody told me I could see three and catch two every time I went, sign me up. I've caught 21 in a day. Well, I can't tell you how many days I went last year and didn't see one. Every year is different. I think this year is going to be a very good year for a lot of reasons. This year reminds me weather-wise of 93 during the Superstorm when we had bloody, bloody Wednesday, bloody Wednesday, bloody Tuesday. One of the best years ever. I think we're going to have that year this year. Um, I just see the weather tide setting up perfect. Yes, sir. I think the red tide might affect any of it. Don't think so. Red tide's gone. We shouldn't see any more of that. As many storms as we've had this spring, I don't think we'll see red tide this year. It should be all broken up. Well, guys, we've talked way up. We've gone way over our limit tonight, I think. Um, but it's getting kind of late. If there's anybody's got any questions, we'll be glad to answer those. Um, but we appreciate everybody coming out. We've been here for quite a while. Um, we got to let Todd come up here and say some closing words here. All right. Is that pretty informative? That was, that was really good, guys. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, at the end of every one of these, more than half of you guys walk up to the front and have some specific individual questions, and you want to look at some of the stuff firsthand, some of the, the rigs that are tied up here, please feel free to do it. Um, we're going to go through the raffle in just a second. Um, one thing I did not talk about before we started was boat safety and having our guys back here in the red. Did everybody notice them when they came in? Towboat US, 
Tugboat US is here. They're a sponsor of this event, and they're here every single month. And um, they have an awesome value for, for you guys. And if you have a boat and you don't have Tugboat US, it is imperative that you get it. So please make sure to stop at their table. Talk to Shane and the guys tonight before you leave. That's one thing that, that Legendary offers exclusive to any other dealers that I know of in the country. Because when you buy a boat, whether it be used, consigned, brokered, or new from Legendary Marine, we give you a one-year membership to Towboat US. And hopefully you never have to use it, but if you ever get to a spot where you have to use it, especially offshore, it is a nice, nice thing to have. They also have some free giveaways on this table here. So they've got some, um, some measuring sticks there, some law sticks. Make sure you stop and get one for your boat. We have a pretty good crowd tonight, at least 100 people. So give yourself a round of applause. Thank you for coming out here. Okay, and we'll do that at the end, uh, Tim, typically. You know, we're, we've got these discount cards. And these discount cards we give away at every one of these seminars. And it's a discount card to half inch tackle. It's $20 off of any $50 purchase or greater. So it is a very significant discount card. I have a feeling that the majority of you will find a way to stop by half inch tackle tomorrow and pick up some gear for this year's Kobe season. These cards will save you 20 bucks. Sound good? All right. We've got some pretty cool raffles tonight. And, uh, come on, young man. Where's the hat you last month? Oh, yes, Did your hair grow too big? Or did you put it on too long? All right. So I want you to help me pull some of these raffle tickets. All right. Richard, uh, Richard Pugh. Richard Pugh. I'm going to give you a Skeeter hat. Fantastic. I got the boat. Yeah. <laughs> you can wear your hat when you come by the boat. Um, Thank you, Richard. Where's Michael Bond? Where's Michael? There he is in the back. I'll tell you what I'll give you, Michael. You don't own a skier. What boat do you own? 243 Everglades. Is that a fine boat or what? All right. I'm going to give you a, I'll tell you what I'm going to give you some really nice braids. There's a $50 full of 40 pound cigar brain. That should go a long way. Thank you, brother. All right. T E R H A A R. Trahar. Okay, is that you? Yep. All right. Say it again. Trahar. All right. We'll give you a Skeeter hat. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hunter Mitchell. Where's Hunter? Hunter Mitchell, come on up here, buddy. There's a nice Skeeter hat for you. Good job, Hunter. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Roger Rusnet. Roger? All right, man. How about some braid? Fish braid? Yes. All right. 40 pounds full of Seaguar premium braid. Thank you, sir. All right. Where's Gary Adams? All right, Gary. My boat is lucky tonight, man. I'll be sitting in the boat next time. How about a Costa Del Mar gift bag? All right. There's like five pairs of polar ice sunglasses. Does anybody remember how important polar ice sunglasses are? How a good pair of polar ice sunglasses, how good they are? Shane Jacobs. Shane Jacobs here still? There you are. How about a red 19th annual Carbon Walk Copia shirt? Thank you, man. <laughs> Chris McIntosh. Chris, all right, man. You have to go on the southeast side for this one, No, 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 but nice long sleeve hard walk could be a turn for sure. All right. And uh, once again, before we before we uh, finish up, 
come up here. Everyone in the audience, audience can get one of those discount cards to half hits you can use tomorrow. And remember the two Cobia tournaments we talked about. The two month long 19th annual Harbor Walk Cobia tournament. If you want to sign up, the place to sign up is at the captain's party two nights from now at 6 o'clock at Jack and Kuda's in Harbor Walk Village, directly behind on the retail level of the uh, Emerald Grands. And then uh, a tournament that's named after myself, my cousin, and my brother, the Royal Rumble. That's a, that's a tournament where you take wounded veterans that have fought for our freedom out maybe for their first time ever on a boat in salt water. And you take the Kobe fishing up and down the beach, and you bring their families back, and then we fry, grill, blacken, and do whatever to that Kobe and have a killer party that night. That's on uh, April the 9th. So get ready. Join us for the Rumble, uh, Royal Rumble. Thank you again on behalf of Everglades Boats, Skeeter Boats, Yamaha Motors, Half Fish Tap, and Legendary Rain. Thank you very much. Y'all come on up if you want these discount cards. Thank <laughs> you.